out a few things today. We got a news article from the OMMA on the new director, Dr. Kelly Williams. Uh, We also have a little bit today we're going to talk about the transporter licenses from the OMMA and kind of go over a couple of examples of that and then talk about the cartels and uh, a new series on Netflix, The World's Most Wanted. Oh, yes. So... Let's kick it off with a new article from the OMMA on Dr. Kelly Williams. We got a new director, or a new interim director over there, which is exciting. Dr. Kelly Williams. She has a background in clinical psychology, right? Yeah. Uh, looks like background in psychology, uh, quantitative psychology from OU. Looks like she got her bachelor's in psychology from OCU and master's and PhD from OU. So she's like a research methods and statistics type person, which will be nice. She does campaign consulting and compliance stuff on the side. So like that makes a lot of sense. Okay. It must be that some of those community initiatives that she's got going on. Uh, She's going to be replacing Travis Kirkpatrick, who had been in there Prior to that, he was the interim director initially and then was uh, named the permanent director for the past year. I think like eight months. Yeah. And he's he his background's a little bit different. We had some info pulled up on him. Um, He has a criminal justice corrections degree and then got his master's in like administrative stuff. He's a bureaucrat it sounds right let's see if we can get him pulled the wheels rolling and he you know he was the perfect guy to get it started because he knew how an administrative body should run oh yeah he knew how to get the right people in the right spots let's see if we can get him pulled up we got a linkedin got his linkedin page pulled up let me switch this over masters in public administration and public policy Oh, he worked for, he was the program manager. Uh, he was the uh, administrator for the pseudoephedrine tracking system for the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics uh, from July 2004 to 2009. So when you go buy cold medicine at Walgreens, um, they keep track of all that. And he was the guy that implemented the tracking system. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that's cool. That was when. I'm a fan. That was when I was in high school. So he. Graduated from uh, UCO with a BA in criminal justice and corrections in 2004, then went directly into working at the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics for five years, and then went administrative civil rights investigator for Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and 
uh, is it services? Yeah. Social services. That's awesome. Yeah. So he was a investigator for there for three years and then came over. This, this is how he transitioned over oh, to the Oklahoma he health did, department. Uh, Medicaid fraud, civil rights investigation. Oh, that's. And that was. I bet that was for two nice. years. Yeah. But that's how he got in, you know, outside of the department of mental health. That's how he started getting into the health department, mm-hmm. Medicaid fraud, civil rights, and then OPI administrator. Office of Juvenile Affairs for five years. Office of Public Integrity. So it looks like it all licensing and assessment of OGA or OJA uh, certified operations. What is that? Office of Juvenile Affairs. Oh, okay. Contract monitoring unit. So five years, two months. My lord. It's probably crazy. looking into a lot of the deferred sentencing and stuff and like while that. While he was doing that job, he got his master's from OU in administrative. That's what I was going to say. So he he left Medicaid, fraud, and civil rights and went into that Office of Juvenile Affairs. And then while he was there in his last three years, it looks like he got his Master of Public Administration, Public Policy. Yeah, and now he is the... Um, Which he finished in 2019, and that's when he left... Office of Juvenile Affairs into the newly formed Oklahoma okay. Medical Marijuana Authority. So he was interim director for four months. Yep, and we're going to go over that uh, timeline at the OMMA, the history of the news article and formation of the administrative body. But he was there from the beginning. Now he's the deputy commissioner. Of, or no, what is it? Yeah, no, deputy commissioner of the Oklahoma State Department of Health. Yep. That was his new position he was appointed to, and he's head, o- head over, uh, it was preparedness. preparedness or, uh, prevention and preparedness, which sounds like a daunting task. I feel like this dude's up for the job, though. Have fun. Yeah, this is what uh, prevention and preparedness covers. So he switched over from... The, the newly booming medical marijuana industry. To the new, newly booming pandemic. Yeah. Definitely a bummer. Spots. I mean, I'm sure... So I'm like, sure he can, you know, bring some light to it, you know? Yeah. The uh, excitement from the OMMA. Twitter, he seems to be a pretty decent human being. Well, good. But she's, you know, she's going to bring something new to it. She's going to bring more of a, a statistic-based approach to it a yeah. little maybe a little more organized a little more research based <laughs> uh, i feel like she'll be uh let's pull up hers we got dr kelly williams so she looks like her specialty was more on and that's really the main thing she's done is the research methods and minor in evolutionary psychology. She studied quantitative psychology, so yeah, she is a numbers person. And you found some uh, campaign stuff. Oh yeah, she does. Uh, she and I don't know who you are, but once you get there, you're good. If you pull it up, I'll uh, Danielle Ezel. Okay, yeah. Heartland campaigns. They are both former I know legislative her too. candidates. Um, and so they do compliance stuff, polling, strategy, yeah. and work with various political campaigns. That's cool. That is neat. Well, she's kind of involved in the politics similarly it as would, Kilpatrick. Yeah. That or Kirkpat- Kirkpatrick. Shake the right hands, meet the right people. You too. Right, you can get in there. A marijuana agency. <laughs> We're interested. We, I'd be interested in going up there. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely work for them. The OMMA is uh, only impressed me thus far. With yeah, like what they've been given to do, it's a pretty daunting task. They uh, like just being able to get all the licenses out during that first rush, like. Yeah, that's been the biggest thing that they were focused on initially, and. I'm sure they'll get around to getting all the feedback from the businesses and stuff mm-hmm. once things kind of 
I mean, it's very new. Hash out this year. Um, I mean, that was about it in the news, though. What anything else? Yeah, I mean, it's I exciting. She's in there. The other uh, news I've seen this week has just been kind of rehashing the numbers, like we're going to be eight hundred million by the end of the year. Yep, majority. that's already. And they talk about that uh, down at the bottom there on the Marijuana Business Daily article. 860 million this year, more than double the 345 million of 2019 is what they're projected for. That is crazy. Yep. It's just going to get crazier, too. Nobody's going outside. 7% of that goes into the state coffers. Not, not bad. Not bad. I mean, with that kind of money comes a decent amount of power. So let's see you know, how this agency grows and it's an essential service. It is. It's important. I find it essential. I this most certainly do. This thing over here is something we found that I thought was just kind of interesting. It's a little flow chart of all the stuff you can do. Where your cannabis goes. And uh, I mean, you can kind of go through some of your favorites if you want to, Sean. Um, I mean, I like all of the, I, I mean, I, I basically just smoke flour nowadays, but if I were going to, uh, go into, I like tinctures, I like uh, live resin. This is just a nifty thing we pulled up. Uh, it's fun to look around and see everything. Cause I know when you go into the dispensaries, you don't get to see everything that you can do and they don't really talk about it. In no, a lot of yeah, detail because no. they're not processors or growers always. Uh, the other stuff we were going to talk about is transporting and the transporter licenses. Uh, so kind of like Jason Statham. <laughs> what we're going to go through here. It is a bit more like Jason, Jason Statham than you'd think. Like right? You are basically just throwing 10 pounds in your trunk and driving from a farm to a dispensary or something. Sounds like a pretty decent gig. And it's, they don't have a lot of guidance on it. It's pretty straightforward. No, um, you are just a legal middleman slash wheelman. Sounds pretty awesome. It's vague enough that uh, they're going to kind of let you lay out what you, you know, what you do with it, what you want to do. And these are the Oklahoma Health Department's initial rules. Is uh, is there a limit on how much you can tra or how much uh, flour you can transport at any given time as a transporter? I didn't see anything like that. Let's see. I, di I didn't see anything specifically on the amount. Out. Yeah. I think it just says that you're authorized to do that. Um, and they don't have, I don't believe they have, possession, have limits possession limits on here. They're talking more about uh, how they're required to be transported and what type of vehicles are required. And they say a locked, so all medical marijuana and medical marijuana products shall be transported in a locked shipping container, shielded from public view, and clearly labeled medical marijuana or derivative. And in a secured area of the vehicle that is not accessible by the driver during transit. It's like how you used to have to carry guns in Oklahoma in your car. Really? Yeah. You used to like not, you couldn't have access to the ammunition or something like that. Oh, you had to keep them separate? Yeah, unless you had a conceal and carry. Uh, and I guess it's just because this is... And it's an annual license? That's just, you do this, you re-up that once a year just like your medical card? Yeah, and it looks like you get, and I think the other set of rules has more on that, but it's, you get one with your, like, as a commercial license mm -hmm. holder, you get a transporter license. Okay. And you renew it like your uh, commercial license. It does not look like it's that tough to get one. No, they say... How much is the fee? A hundred bucks? Yeah, to this body which is all we're seeing here, but the uh, saying on the vehicles, all vehicles used to transport medical marijuana and medical marijuana products shall be equipped with active global positioning systems, 
tracker system trackers, which shall not be mobile cellular cellular devices and which shall be capable of storing and transmitting GPS data and ensure data are above legal requirements in Oklahoma. So you just get a third party GPS and it, and put it on your car. Yep. Sounds about it. Or on your like transportation a, vehicle. Like a private eye tracking a cheating spouse. Yep, pretty much. It's the same technology. Uh mm -hmm. We saw some videos. Does I it say that your trunk counts as the locked container, though? I mean, based on what they have on here, it says a locked shipping container. Oh. But uh, I don't know if they define shipping container. Let's see. Shipping container. Give me shipping container for 200 Oh, there it was. Wait. Back one. Shipping container. Hard sided container with a lid or other enclosure that can be secured into place. A shipping container is used solely for the transport of medical marijuana, medical marijuana business. Wait. Concentrate. Or concentrate medical marijuana pro uh, products between medical businesses, uh, a medical marijuana research facility, or a medical marijuana education facility. Okay, so they do set it out. It's like it needs to be a separate lockbox. Okay. So I guess technically you could. A cooler with a lock on it. You could detach a trunk from a vehicle and secure it inside of another vehicle, and it could qualify as a shipping container. You could get like a small trailer. That would be more in line with probably what they're thinking than our trunk in trunk used as a shipping container. Yeah. We can make it work, though. I'm sure we can. Nothing's off limits. You just got to kind of bend the words a little bit. Have enough, yeah, have a good enough lawyer, and you can do nearly anything. So... We'll kick back to the transporter license here. Uh, uh, inventory manifest. Yeah, you got to okay, keep your so manifest you and stuff. Do have to, if you become a trucker. You're a common point. carrier, yeah, essentially, like for them. But you're employed uh, within the company, unless mm -hmm. you're an independent transporter. They talk a little bit about that, about where you're authorized to transport to. Uh like if you don't have one of those license. Supporting documentation. Oh, remember when uh, they pulled over those hemp farm or the hemp transporters on I-40 and seized their load, uh, tested it for THC and like arrested the drivers. Mm -hmm. It was a big deal. Like it was right after the law passed and there was it was in the news for a while. I okay. think they finally had to release the load to them. I could see that. They're heading to like Georgia. And it was just hemp. They're like, yeah. They're making rope, brother. Test it. It's below. It's below the cutoff. They're like, it has THC present. It's like, yeah, it'll do it. Like trace amounts. Okay. So uh, pretty straightforward on there. We have another set of requirements that have a little bit more info. Um. Yeah, so these are, this is the Unity Act, the OMMA regs. Oh, I mean, like, you need one if you're just, like, helping with logistics. Yeah. Storage. Cool. So, you can either get it. They shall issue, says the Medical Marijuana Authority shall issue a medical marijuana transporter license to licensed medical marijuana commercial growers, processors, and dispensaries upon issuance of such licenses and upon each renewal. A uh, transporter license may also be issued to qualifying applicants who are registered with the Oklahoma Secretary of State and who otherwise meet the requirements for a medical marijuana business license. Neat. So, and their role would be to, to provide logistics, distribution, and storage of medical marijuana medical marijuana concentrate and products that would be a neat angle to get into the business like you just are a uh, storage facility for people's excess weed like yep. humidity controlled i mean that's that's kind of what they're setting out here and what some people are starting to try to do is you can be a distribution hub which would be a good thing for oklahoma that's like mm -hmm. what we were kind of set up on on the railroad I mean, that's kind of how Oklahoma has operated in the black market as a hub for, you know, I mean, like cocaine, meth, weed, heroin. If you're getting it in New York and it's coming from south of the border, it's going through Oklahoma at some point. 
Well, they can, I mean, it'd be a way to repurpose all the industrial facilities along the highway down there. Down on 40? Yeah. Yeah. Like a bunch of holding facilities once it becomes legal nationwide. There's a ton of commercial land or real estate down there. Yeah. Um, Or industrial real estate. Commercial and like uh, heavy use Mm -hmm. uh, industrial. A lot of buildings that uh, accidentally catch fire and burn to the ground. Yeah, they're not, not very well maintained down there. No. The whole, there's a huge homeless population down there. That's where they hold it down. Well, I think they're insurance fires for the most part. But like you, you just think? Like let people squat it and you know they're going to be building fires in there. So so they talk, we were talking about earlier where you're required to have one. A transporter license shall be required for any person or entity to transport or transfer medical marijuana, concentrate, or product from a licensed medical marijuana business to another medical marijuana business or from a medical marijuana business to a medical marijuana research facility or medical marijuana education facility. So it's the same same type of area, but those, that's what you have to have a license for. If you're going to move it off of the property... Medical marijuana education facility sounds very cool. There was a shop downtown uh, called like Red Bug. I, I think they mm-hmm. closed. Yeah, but yeah. He would do like grow classes. Mm-hmm. He's a big proponent of living soil, which is uh, very cool. It's a big deal. Time consuming to keep your soil alive. And expensive to check your balances and stuff. No, it's like the way they do it is. Uh, like amend the soil with they they want it to be as close to like natural they like let little weeds grow and things it's it's weird hmm. I know that for a yard of it he was charging so much he buy dirt by the yard mm-hmm. and dude what it would cost to fill a raised bed with this stuff is worth a down payment on a car that's crazy but it's good. Yeah, it's great. It's good shit. Yeah, you can do the same thing at home by amending soil, introducing nematodes, uh, only using, you know, organic uh, nutrients, which are just poop. Yeah. Bad. So you earthworms, ca- earthworm castings. But you have to know how much poop to put in there. You can't just yes. be dumping poop into your dirt yeah, and like expect two, it to come out with high nitrate. I think we do like two tablespoons per gallon of water or something like that. Of. Um, and do you just like flowering nutrients? Do you just save the poop from the toilet, or how do you usually? Uh, no, I, I buy my poop um, from Dirty Mike an down at the garden railroad store, uh, near my house. Dirty Mike and the boys have discount poop down <coughs> by the Shout railroad out to track. Organics OKC. I don't think he works there anymore. Yeah, Dirty Mike. Mm-mm. He's their poop guy. He got in Always trouble. Has been. He was <laughs> he was apparently using his connections over there to sell poop off of the clean market. Ooh, see, that is actually the dirty very market. dangerous. Never use human waste to um, fertilize your garden. That is called night soil. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Night soil? Yes. And it was a huge problem in the specifically the American South. Um, the, uh, the trope of the Southerner being lazy, slow, and dumb actually comes uh, from a, a little bit of truth. Everyone had hookworm. From walking around, mm, in, mm-hmm. yeah, and like with no shoes on, and uh, getting you know in contact with a f- infected human feces that were being used to, uh, you know, in the fields and stuff. Oh God! So well, I mean, that makes sense. You don't want to shit where you garden. No. I guess is that how it goes? Something yeah. like that. Shit where you eat. Don't shit where you eat. There's something. There's an in between step there. Turns don't out shit. They say that because of hookworm. Don't shit where you garden. To harvest the food that you eat. Yeah, hookworm just like, ew, it'd be a horrible thing to have. Uh, but, uh, so, the other thing they talk about on here is what you're authorized to do. You may maintain a licensed premises to temporarily store medical marijuana, concentrate in products, and to use as a centralized distribution point. This is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, you could be the Amazon of marijuana if this thing goes, you know, well, if Amazon just doesn't become the Amazon of marijuana. Yeah. You could I mean Jeff Bezos is willing to lose money for so long to drive all competitors out of business. You know he probably smokes. He's got some glaucoma or something going on with that eye. 
I mean, he's the richest man in the world. I'm sure he does a lot of weird things. That's not weird to smoke, you know, with a crazy eye. No, I mean, like, things you would not think he does. That's what I mean. Uh, like, uh, he does have a crazy eye, though. Like, send pictures of his dick to him. Yeah, I mean, it's not my thing. Everybody's got their vibe. Let's see. A medical marijuana transporter may store and distribute medical marijuana concentrated products from the licensed premises. And the licensed premises shall meet all security requirements applicable to your normal medical marijuana business. You also have to use the seed to sale tracking system. And you can operate multiple warehouses. I, I dig the seed to sale thing. I'm mm-hmm. pretty excited about that. Just in terms of, uh, like, as a consumer, I'm excited about seed to sale. I'm sure it is a headache to anyone that actually has to implement this system. Uh, like the growers and everything, but you know it's for the greater good. It's going to be a lot of paperwork, and but but at least they'll know. Do they have to? So if you go and ask them, I wonder if they have to tell you. Uh, that would be in here, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm sure it is. I we didn't. We're not in that section. I was also, just kind of curious what you think. Temporarily, you think store. they should have to tell you? Because I know I've asked before, and they're like, nah. I've definitely. This is, uh, my boss told me that I'm not supposed to tell anybody where this stuff comes from. I have been told. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, mm-hmm. Some people will not tell you where it comes from, and my initial thought there is like, oh, so it's something that failed out in Oregon, that's or what, California. I tried to ask something like that, and they didn't take it well for some reason. And it suspiciously usually a uh, company that has like a parent company in California or Oregon. Yeah, it always is. There's one like that near my house. They just sell like little. That was one I saw downtown. They're closed now, I believe. Good. Because they did have some California products. Um, so the concentrate. So they're talking about the transporting again here. And we talked about this in the bigger, the original health department rule. But they say it must be equipped with GPS trackers in a lock container and clearly labeled medical marijuana or derivative and in a secured area of the vehicle that is not accessible to the driver during transit. So they kind of elaborate a little bit on that. Locked box in your trunk. Yeah. Can't have a hatchback. And it needs to say medical marijuana on it. Big weed leaf on it with a, uh, like a cross. Yeah. Right? Is that the sign? I would put it. I would, yeah, never mind. That's good. Uh... So they say a transporter agent may possess marijuana at any location while the transporter agent is transferring marijuana to or from a licensed medical marijuana business, research facility, or education facility. So it authorizes them to possess it. I wonder uh, how they define temporary in terms of the storage. Uh, Probably, let's see if they say it. Let's go back. Does it put a cap on it? Let's see what they got. Because I Temporary. mean, like, flower shelf life when stored correctly is. What do you think? I don't know. I'm storage. Not seeing it. Yeah, I don't see. We got another trans uh, shipping container definition. <laughs> yeah, um, it's definitely not. Um, I don't permanent, know. Permanent temporary storage. Six months? I mean, I think that anything that's not permanent is temporary. Like, because they are a transporter place, Mm -hmm. as long as it's not being kept there indefinitely and there is some plan to move it, it's probably temporary. But they don't say. We couldn't find it. Find the aged cannabis. And I think that's the main... The main stuff with the transporter license. It's kind of crazy. Uh... It seems like it is a choose your own adventure of uh, of medical marijuana business dealings. Like, not only can you drive it, but you can negotiate the sales between. Is, is, am I reading into this wrong? Are you I mean, I think you're. Man? I think you're a common carrier, so I think you're just uh, negotiating storage and stuff like that. I don't think you're negotiating sales price like that. Okay. You're probably just acting as the the middleman, and you're negotiating your price of temporary storage and oh, yeah. shipment and delivery and stuff. 
an inventory manifest shall be or shall not be altered after departing the original premises other than in cases where the printed name and signature of receipt by the receiving licensee is necessary. So it sounds like everything has been negotiated prior to you making a pickup of this product. Yep. You're just doing the common carrier. Yep. Uh, cool. But it's it's cool and it's crazy. This would be a great way to get into business. So it's a good transition into our other topic that we're going to talk about, the cartels. Because one of the things that's crazy about Arizona, I mean, I was watching another special and all the shipments that go through Phoenix, because it's a major distribution hub, a lot of the local gangs have started uh, knocking over the uh, shipments. And because weed is a fungible good, fungible good. Yeah, it can go bad. Well, it's one of those ones that's not identifiable. Like, it's not... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't say this is... I mean, you You can't say this is this, this is where... It doesn't have, like, a... Point of origin. Or a barcode or anything like that. Um, So, if you get it and you introduce it into the stream of commerce... You could do genomic Outside of branding and genetics. If you had, like, a large enough sample base to pull from and be like, okay, this comes from this region. Like they do with, like, vegetables. Yeah. But they don't they don't have the resources for that. We just we just saw that the OMMA finally has a director in place that's gonna that actually, do something yeah, beyond not temp- licensing. Temporary, yeah. Uh, so they're getting around to genetic testing for sources of marijuana distribution. But the I mean, they're talking seed to sale. DEA implementing does it. that's going to be interesting. I think she's going that sh- is going to be one of the first things she she's going to tackle. Well, the it's crazy that the. Uh, cartels have that much exposure in the U.S. when it comes to their product. Like oh, that yeah. the gangs are that brazen that they'll just hit the cartels. Yeah, that is pretty scary. So I got... That is definitely a fast track to getting decapitated and hung from a bridge. Right. So we got uh, El Mayo... This is Ismael Zambada Garcia, and he was, is potentially the head of the Sinaloa cartel. And was, is, is the most terrifying part of that. It's like, we really don't know. Yeah. And this was the special that they just had on Netflix about it, covering a bunch of different, uh, world's most wanted, terrifying people. Yeah. The series is called the world's most wanted on Netflix. Just came out. Season one, episode one is El Mayo about the cartels. And he was the top lieutenant of El Chapo is what they say. But it seemed more like they were kind of partners at the top. And he's older than El Chapo by like a decade or so. I mean, I actually, it looked kind of like El Chapo deferred to him on several, you know, like key business decisions in terms of this guy's the guy moving the powder. Chapo is the guy keeping the business infrastructure intact. El Chapo seemed like he was more of the, he was the tunnel and uh, like smuggling Mm -hmm. logistics expert. Keeping uh, supply lines running or what, as it were. That's what the brothers uh, did in, is it the, not Delta and Leyva, but uh, that's what they were doing up there. That was what they were in charge of. Um, And... I mean, that's how each individual cartel gained their power was they it's like, OK, when cocaine moves from the United States or from uh, Colombia to here into the United States, like we are in charge of getting it from here over the, this border. Like initially, they just did transport. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. That was what uh, Mexico kind of started out doing. And they I mean, they were able to dominate things for quite a while. But once the u.s and mexico both went after uh the cartel heads they always use the hydro metaphor you know they they took one of the big heads down that organized everything and everybody split up and they weren't able like the organizations fracture into smaller organizations back into the old plaza system Mm -hmm. is what they kind of defaulted back into and el mayo was like i said is the head of Sinaloa, which is one of the ones that's still around. Like the other ones, Juarez and Tijuana, they both kind of, they have their own specialty, but they're smaller. They have, yes. uh, 
like their own little territory. Whereas Sinaloa is more centrally located. That's where everything was run from. It's not a border territory like Juarez and Tijuana are no. or the Gulf's territory over in the Gulf. Um, They're more insulated. Um, in most recently, if you want to like see crazy videos, uh, earlier this year, the Mexican military tried to arrest El Chapo's son in uh, Culiacan. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sicarios and cartel guys uh, rallied to the city, fought the army, and got uh, the guy released. So, I mean, they run that part of Mexico. Yeah, they can't. I mean, they can't do anything because the federal government doesn't have a lot of power. In the end of this special, they actually talk about how the Mexican federal government has officially ended their war on drugs, <laughs> and they're not going to be going. I mean, on the federal level, they're not going to be going after these criminal organizations anymore because they realize it's futile. Yeah, and super dangerous. Um, Looks like uh, make Oklahoma this. City is a hub for the Sinaloa cartel. We'll make it a little bigger, hopefully. Yeah, so uh, we're looking at a map from United – it's from the DEA intelligence report from 2015, and it's the United States and areas of influence of major Mexican transnational criminal organizations – it's available on the DEA's website. But they track the influence by their DEA field offices and the amount of cases that are showing up associated with the different cartels. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine most of the contact they have associated with the Sinaloa cartel comes on I-40 and I-35. If you ever see those uh, SUVs sitting in mm -hmm. the median, <clears throat> those are drug interdiction officers. And they are just pulling people over, looking for money, and looking for drugs. That's all they do all day. And, I mean, when you pull up this map, you'll be able to see this, but it's crazy. All Sinaloa pretty much controls all of the central distribution and east and west coast. Mm -hmm. And some of the other ones are starting to get some pieces. Like the Gulf controls a lot of the Texas border, uh, along with Los Cetas and what's left of them. But, uh, yeah, Sinaloa still controls most of it. And that shows you their overall power because they're not a primary hub of distribution. Like, they're not a border distribution hub that automatically gets a cut because of that. They hold power because they're a protection racket, yeah. you know. Paramilitary force almost. I mean, they have a paramilitary force for sure, but everyone has their own little section of the black market when you're running that, you know, mm -hmm. you have your protection rackets, you have your distribution, that type of stuff. You have your grow, but they lit their location. Sonora is really the central location for most of the marijuana grow. And like we talked about last episode, they're supplying less and less of American marijuana. Yeah. I mean, they send brick swag up here. So the influence, it's pretty gross. They do do a lot of grows, like gorilla grows yeah, in national and forests and, and things like that. It's That's pretty terrifying. It is. You'd hate to come across that. And they they pollute the hell out of those areas. Like They, they don't uh, follow environmental they regulatory. They pouring miracle grow on these plants. Programs. And you don't want to be smoking that stuff. Right? That's why I don't grow stuff around here because I'm Mr. Miracle Grow. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's great for flowers. Yeah. I just can't eat any of them. Yeah. I wouldn't light them on fire anytime soon breathe them in so this is a this is another one kind of looking at the regional dominance and this is more looking at the border influence so you look overall about everything and the it, gulf pretty much has the south south of texas and sinaloa controls all of the all of the u.s excluding uh new mexico and the southern half of texas yeah and that's, southwestern texas is pretty I mean, what is what would that be? Juarez. Juarez. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Gulf controls the other half. That's the part of Texas where they are straight throwing bodies over the border. That's because the Juarez cartel got blown up. They're not really around as much as they used to be, or as strong as they used to be. But uh, they were pretty powerful for a long time. They were the ones that recognized 
how much power you have as one of the border hubs. Mm -hmm. Them and the Tijuana were the first ones to break off and kind of, they started their own cartels because they recognized the influence you have as the primary way to get in Mm -hmm. to your distribution network. Yeah. And if you didn't have that, you had to go through the Gulf. And that was where Miguel and Hale fell apart back in the day was he tried to go partner with the Gulf when they kind of turned on him and all three of them partnered together to push him out as the former godfather of all of them. They push him out. They partner with uh, the Colombian cocaine distribution Mm -hmm. and they get the real money along with the primary distribution routes, and then they break it back up. Turns out guys doing cocaine all the time are not very trustworthy. Nope. <laughs> Hard to do business with. Yeah, right? And a little wishy-washy. They don't like having a boss. Nobody likes having a boss. Um, I mean, these are talk, kind of talking about the heroin and fentanyl uh, yeah. epidemics and where those are going on and the number of deaths versus cartel presence. But it, it's the same type of deal. Huge... Uh, fentanyl rates in California and Texas is what they were showing up. Uh, and then in the Northeast. Yeah, my God, and Ohio Midwest. seems to be getting the worst of it. Yeah, they're number one, which is interesting. I wonder why. I don't know. I, I, I know like, uh, like Appalachia has always had problems with, uh, you know, like hillbilly heroin, but. Well, I feel like it's because of the working class nature of the population that they're in that location because of their proximity to huge Cleveland, metropolitan areas. Columbus. Like, they do all the work for the huge metro area and they don't get paid as much, which is why they would be addicted to things like heroin. Oh, and Cleveland is horrifying. Yeah. Rivers just like on fire. Yeah. I mean, that's where we keep all of our Hall of Fames. So you know, it's important to us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's up there. Yeah. NFL, uh, right? Canton, Ohio. Uh, Cooperstown isn't. Is that in Ohio? They're all around there somewhere. Everything starts in Ohio and ends there, apparently. Oh, Lord. Uh, let's see. What else we got? We got the major cartels that are still going on. We talked about that a little bit. Um, we can go over the ones that are topping the charts. But uh, the biggest thing to think about is how. They're all breaking up, and it's going to continue to fractionalize. Yeah, it's a power vacuum at this point. And yeah. what would even make it easier to like win against these cartels would be to make marijuana legal. All of it. Or all of it. I mean, like, yeah, definitely all of it. But I think you're going to have a harder sell telling, you know, like the average American, like, that you want to make heroin legal than you would if, you know, like we could definitely get federal legalization of marijuana way before people are going to say, oh yeah, just no more war on drugs. It's just been pounded into people's heads too long. I know. Dude, I saw, uh, you remember Dare? Mm -hmm. Dare's back. No. Dare was at Crest uh, Market. Really? Talking to people as they were walking out. They go, do you remember Dare? And I go, yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, at all. I learned about a lot of different drugs through Dare. They turned their parents in for smoking weed. I know the first time I'd ever seen the syringe was on the examples table of the mm-hmm. dare display. Yeah. So they, you know, they educated people. I mean, I never got into it, so I guess it maybe worked for me. Yeah, but I never really got. I I don't credit dare with me not being a drug addict. Yeah. Like I, th- I, I don't know. I credit things like Requiem for a Dream. Oh yeah. You That's know what I mean? One. The Wire. Definitely the uh, Wire. Bubbles. You know, he's one of those guys where you're like. Uh, or just, I don't know. I think... Uh, He's a nice guy. And everything. Yeah, Bubbles was actually my favorite character. Right? I like, could see that. I could see you like relating to Bubbles a little bit I for really some reason. Him a lot. Like, He's like, a nice guy. He's, he's a just talker. He's a smart, troubled man. Right? He knows how to stay out of the wrong kind of trouble. Yeah. Stay friends with the right kind of people. He's... Uh, oh, it, it kind of hurt my soul. Actually, no, no spoilers. If you haven't watched The Wire, though, I'd get on it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any new episodes coming out anytime soon. So no. you got time there's to catch up. There's a guy that uh, wanders the streets near my house that looks so much like Bubbles. Really? Yeah. Well, they did a good job of... He's terrible, though. I've seen no redeeming qualities in this man. <laughs> but, you know, he's not getting... I don't see him all the time. I don't get the full character arc. So on this uh, 
This one is the Congressional Research Service uh, update on Mexico organized crime and the drug trafficking and drug trafficking organizations. And this was from 2019. Yeah, I just believe. the end of last year. So this is probably the most updated uh, governmental report. So on a cannabis, lot of methamphetamine. A lot of methamphetamine. It's 11. I mean 3 metric tons. They can manufacture. We can go through each of these. I was going to just jump into the marijuana one. Yeah, yeah, let's, I mean we're doing a marijuana podcast. Sorry to get Hung well, up on meth, meth talk is at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> we record meth talk at it's about 17 four. hours long. Yeah, <clears throat> never ends. Uh, we actually do a lot of phone calls to the police department just to make sure <laughs> that they're following proto. Uh, they don't, they never do. Uh, a lot of peeking out the peephole and freaking out. We're trying to do a grassroots movement to start live PD again. And uh, we're just we're going around to the police departments, and we're just kind of handing cameras out, trying to get them all rolling. It's a process. What's a hectare? Uh, like hectare. How many hectares are an acre? Or I want to say it's like it's acre. something like an acre. It's like the metric version of an acre. But that's what they're always talking about, and because I was listening to the business of uh, cocaine on that same. Oh. Netflix deal? A hectare is 2.47 acres. Okay. So there we go. Two and Almost two and a half acres. And they were saying that they can cover like up to one when they're hand tearing out all the cocaine plants. They were talking about that on the business. Dude, that would per be day. a horrible job. Yeah, they just rip them out of the ground. Yeah, that's And burn sucks. them. But uh, so can cannabis. In 2017, Mexico seized 241 metric tons of marijuana and eradicated more than 40 230 hectares of marijuana, according to the State Department's 2019 INCSR. However, some analysts foresee a decline in U.S. demand for Mexican marijuana base because drugs other than marijuana will likely become dominant in the future. This projection relates to more marijuana being grown legally in several states in the U.S. and Canada, which have either legalized cannabis or made it legal for medical purposes thus decreasing its value as part of Mexican trafficking organization's profit portfolio. That's great news. Yeah. The bad thing is that just they have to fill their portfolio. Their so efforts elsewhere. Yeah. They're d probably doing human trafficking. Wholesale methamphetamine. Methamphetamine production. Because mm -hmm. um, they can't produce cocaine. Yeah, super labs in Mexico. Like They process cocaine in Mexico, but they don't grow it. Like They can't grow it there. Oh, yeah. yeah. One thing I was thinking about, you know, this is staying on the cocaine train, but I was watching that special last night, and they were talking about how in Colombia, that's the location where it grows the best, and, like, the whole country's prime. And its location is kind of on the northern edge, northwestern edge of the uh, Very well. Amazon basin and stuff. Yeah. So my thought so was... it's like super fertile soil, like anywhere near a river delta. Yeah, I'm going to flip the screen over so they can see it, but... It's like southern Mississippi. Exactly. So where I was about to say, where, what it comes to mind in the U.S. when you think of the best place Yeah, you could probably grow, grow coca in that's southern Mississippi. Because you think about the... It has to be mountainous, but super humid and yeah. moist and always stays wet. Uh, you might not be able to. That's why I was thinking a little further up the river, it's just but too too low. Um, Cotton grows well there. Let me flip it over. Let's get this going on. So where are you from in Mississippi again? Jackson. It's like Jackson. in the middle. Well, that's river river country. It's the capital. Um. So this is a map. This is Google Google Earth here, and we will take a little look. A little look, see, it's like Vicksburg is where the Mississippi River is. So let's zoom out of here. And we'll cruise down to Colombia, Sud America, ah, Colombia. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so. We got the Amazon River Basin that runs east to west out here. 
and empties all over the place. They but have coca in Peru too, right? <coughs> yep, coca's over here, Ecuador, Peru, up in the mountains, like this flatland area on the east side of the mountains. Um, and Colombia, so you got the mountain ranges, is what I was talking about. But all of this stays on this side of the mountain ranges, so it's not a perfect match. Oopsie. I mean, California, we're talking like. It's too arid. Look at that. Yeah. Even if you went north, there's not enough water. Maybe uh, there, but it's too high. It's too cold. So you need somewhere that's equally far away from the equator. I'm thinking this this little region right here looks looks pretty prime. You probably could, honestly. If, if you could, I'm sure someone's thought about it. Well, I don't think you can right now. Oh, no, no, no. They, haven't, uh, they don't have the medical cocaine program. If you had a program, DEA badge or whatever. Then you could try? Uh, you have to get like uh, permission from the DEA to do experiments on drugs. And I know cocaine is one that is often given out. For, like you have to, they use it for like surgeries on your eye. Like Novocaine like and yeah. Lidocaine, all it's the still other canes. super effective. Uh, but not cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> I bet, no, you, I bet do you do have cocaine. a lot of, I bet you do have a lot of agents that are applying for testing licenses. Sure. Though. So, uh, um, I got I this, uh, licenses. I got a, I got a idea. I'm going to, mm, I'm, I wanted to go to Kentucky. I was, so I was in Kentucky and this guy had this, uh, stuff, never heard of it. Uh, said it was like the stuff that's at the dentist office. We talked for a long time and, uh, we came up with this idea. The idea is we put together a grow facility for cocaine. I mean, you could grow coca in Hello? doors, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, probably. I mean, you can uh, grow anything indoors just because you, you can replicate you know, any kind of environment. It's pretty neat. Well, those you're harvesting the, the leaves, and you're not waiting for flower. You just yeah. take the leaves and process the leaves. I have a friend that went to Peru, and people are just like chewing them all. Yeah? Yeah, you can just like buy the leaves and chew. That'd be intense. Yeah, I think I'm good. I like coffee. Yeah, right? Nice cup. Yeah. Well, cup we'll coffee in a joint is like the opposite of like doing rails of cocaine. <laughs> yeah, right? <I'm, laughs> I like to stay pretty jolly. Like, I'll have a little coffee, some espresso, but uh, I'm not a yabba man. Yeah. You know? Yabba. Yabba. That's a popular go to. Um, let's hop over here for a second. We'll look at. Photo viewer. Let's see if we can get these photos. So these are the some of the dominant groups in the cartel, just by region. And we have a couple of images that we'll look through. It's crazy how much the Sinaloa cartel controls. This All is of the vacation areas, coincidentally. <laughs> right? I mean, the Gulf's trying to move in, but they're getting pushed out. Like... Even though the Gulf holds that territory, mm -hmm. Sinaloa holds the ports. Yeah. Which is the important part. And this is, so this is a huge, important territory that they've been fighting about down here along Guerrero and Jalisco. Uh, so the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion, that's the, the new up and comer, the biggest okay. up and coming cartel. And their position of power is because they, recognize the losing market in marijuana and this west coast of mexico is like the primary import hub for uh methamphetamine pre precursors uh, okay and america loves meth unfortunately as much as we love marijuana but uh i have a couple other ones on here so these are i wonder what the consumption of uh, methamphetamine in the United States is. I have the World Drug Report. We'll look up that next time. Uh, and it breaks them all down. The uh, These are the major drug trafficking routes. So when you go, like over here is where I was talking about in Guerrero. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jalisco, Guadalajara is the main place you think of as the first city when you leave Mexico, you go through Guadalajara on your way up into Culiacan and yeah, the major, yeah. the the uh, Emerald Triangle here where the marijuana is produced. That's where all the marijuana gets grown. And you can see that because that's where the distribution starts. And the name of the 
cartel when it was all consolidated was the Guadalajara cartel. Okay. And uh, now you see these red methamphetamine precursors from Asia are all coming into here. And if we look at this in reference to the other map, we can see that they're coming in to each of the major cartels uh, positions. So like each cartel has their own little yeah, like established uh, smuggling routes. Yes. But Asia's uh, supplying for all the different all cartels. The Myanmar. Uh, China. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely China. Um, but the other ones, you know, are the cocaine routes that come from Colombia and Venezuela and Brazil. And they those are huge uh, grows, too. Not mm -hmm. something I really knew before, but Venezuela and Brazil are also like Venezuela mainly. Is like a huge cocaine grow. I did not know that. And I'll pull, I'll pull up that one next. But uh, on the east side, they come in through the Gulf territories, right? Yeah. Tampico, Reynosa, Veracruz. These are all major hookups. And over here, it's really just the Jalisco. Like the Sinaloa doesn't have prime location there anymore. Mm -hmm. Like they're battling to try to hold on to these territories down here, which is why I was saying that's such a hot ground. Because if they lose access on the west coast right here, they lose not only meth, but also cocaine. Yeah. And they yeah. have to pay whoever Absorbing does get it. Yeah, yeah. So Black market tariffs. Those are your distribution. And then these other ones, these brown lines, those are like the, like the Juarez cartel, the Tijuana cartels. The Zetas, those are the distribution hub cartels that still survive for that purpose. Um, over here, we got... So this is the drug trade, and it shows some of the dominant uh, locations for where they grow and distribute. So here we got the two major... Uh, they call hard drug products, Bolivia, Colombia. Yeah, cocaine. And down here, they also have the coca being distributed out through the south. Oh, to various uh, places where they will turn it into cocaine. Yeah, or they distribute it directly into New York oh, or L.A. Okay. Processing labs in, in the States? Well, it looks like they're... Let's see, they got the crops, the refineries, and it looks like they're probably refining it here. Okay, yeah. And shipping it out. So Uruguay is a big location in Bolivia. But uh, it's just crazy to look at some of these things and see where it goes and see where it comes from and see how small of a role Mexico plays when it comes to the big market. It's crazy. But they're the primary hub because we are the consumer. Because we are the largest consumer. Yep. They're the pipeline into the United States. Yep. And our failed war on drugs has created this crazy, like, we've destabilized an entire region, which is something, like, America is great at doing. Well, we gave them, like, if you wouldn't have picked a fight with them for decades, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have developed the type of paramilitary force they have. Well, we trained a lot of those guys. Like, yeah. In the United States. I mean... it's We tend to do that. We give people money, guns, and training, and then a few decades later, we end up, like, fighting them. <laughs> they become very problematic. So, yeah, it's not the best approach. Uh, it's going to continue, and I think it's crazy to even think about having a transporter's license because they were talking about how the the gangs are knocking over the cartel shipments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But if I was the cartel, I wouldn't worry about growing in the U.S. if I have a paramilitary force and, yeah. a, and a huge presence in the States already. I would go knock over these shit transportation services mm -hmm. that these local state businesses have where you just got the trunk of a car, you know, yeah. drilled into the side of your truck and that's your security. Yeah. Uh, 
I think that'd be a cool. Uh, that that will be scary. Like Heat Two. <laughs> heat Two, Mexican Boogaloo. Yeah, Heat Two, Muy Caliente. <laughs> Very hot. That's really good. Um, I mean, that's the main stuff we wanted to talk about. I don't know if there was anything else that uh, you were excited about. I mean, the cartels are always exciting to talk about. The cartels are always fascinating. And it's been a slow week in marijuana news stateside. It really has. Right. The only stuff we have here is uh, got some new pre-rolls. Those are exciting. That's that's new. I've seen... Does that count? Uh... Yeah, I've seen prices are dropping a little bit. You talked about that. I don't know. Uh, I didn't see that. I think, uh, I mean, right now, anywhere between 1800 and $3,000 for a pound of flour in Oklahoma. Wow. Um, and I think a lot, there are so many greenhouses and, like, huge commercial grows yep. that are about to flood the market that I think we'll see the price drop significantly. And, unfortunately, a lot of people that are selling those $3,000 pounds are probably going to go out of business because i don't think that every single one of them are selling three thousand dollar pounds because uh they didn't drop it to three thousand because it's flying off the shelves or anything well it's i mean they they are flying off the shelves but i think it's three thousand right now or some people are selling three thousand because that's what they have to charge to make money upstart of you know putting grow together i don't think a lot of people understood like the undertaking before they got involved Nope. Like how much money they'd have to spend. Like everyone wants to have the finest facility, but yep. if you spend so much that your weed has to be bought at six thousand dollars a pound, you know. I think uh, you might well not be doing it. Uh, Biggie talked about that in the Ten Crack Commandments, I believe. Uh, talking about consignment, strong word called consignment. Oh yeah, it's been so long since I listened to that. One. Yeah, because they're gonna. I did listen to all of Ready to Die on a. If you ain't got the clientele, say <laughs> hell no, because they're going to want their money. Rain, hail, rain, sleet, hail, snow. Yeah. Is that what it is? People, uh, I mean, I, I want a good product, but I also am not going to pay, like, more than black market prices from 10 years ago for an eighth, you know? Yeah. Uh, if I see a $60 eighth in a store, I'm highly suspicious. I mean, I, I didn't see any price drops. I saw... My favorite, the new uh, pre-roll deals that were in. I was over at Ringside. Okay. You know, that's my go-to. It's my favorite dispensary. Um, and they had two different ones. They got, I don't know. Do you have a fav- Do you have a go-to? What's your favorite dispensary? Um, man, I kind of hop around. I I do like Classy Collective a lot. Okay. It's a little pricey, but I, I like their weed. Well, I go, like I said, over to Ringside, and they have two different pre rolls. I've been to Ringside. That's where I bought my uh, vaporizer, or bought my volcano. Uh, volcano. Nice. They, they got some more in. I'm thinking about buying it. So, Pot County Cannabis is what this okay. pre roll company is called. They're out of Pottawatomie. Yeah, or... they, they only had one T, but I tried to look them up online, and it was the only place I could find was Pot County, P O T T, Growers. Not this company, um, but I like them. They do the Amnesia Haze, which is like my favorite. Yeah. Uh, sativa strain because it's just crank. You know, I'm a fan to the gills. Um, the other is, and just so you know, it's twenty point eight nine percent THC is what they're saying in these pre rolls. Uh, four point zero four terps, and that's that's all the info. That's neat. If you got a good deal, though, it's uh, four for 20. Oh, yeah, it's not bad at all. And those are like full gram. Uh, yep. Okay, yeah. And then uh, Eco Farm is another one. Uh, they're taking more of a like medical approach. And they do a five pack, and it's 25 okay. out the door. That's not bad at all. They come with. That box is awesome. I know. It's got a cool box, biodegradable, and. They got a little match in there with each one of them and a strike. What oh, do you call that it? is so great. Yeah, like a strike a, deal, like a matchbox on the bottom. It is like a giant matchbox. You check it out. That is really cool. Yeah, that's like the little thing that you'd put Stuart Little or the Indian from the yeah. Indian in the cupboard in to sleep in. This is exactly. Night, night. Good night, little. I'm a fan. Native American. That's the coolest packaging I've seen thus far. Right? And... 
they did it affordably because the price wasn't horrible. Yeah, it's, it's uh, recycled cardboard. This one's an orange creamsicle flavor. THC is 16.1%. They say sativa dominant hybrid, but who knows what that means anymore. I just smoked a Choco Loaf. I think this is from Green Roots. Like I, I do like Green Roots also. Okay. They're pretty good. Well, but that's, I mean, those are our favorites. Uh, hopefully, you guys had fun today. It was interesting. It was a little darker than normal. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about, uh, did you watch Love After Lockout? I, I haven't watched it. I've watched two seasons of Schitt's Creek. Oh, yeah. My wife and our friend Mary. Also good. And you watched all of them? Um, I have not finished like every episode, but I've seen a majority of the series now. Okay. Well, it's a good series. We'll talk about it next time. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, we'll talk next time.